Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Go with me, if you will, to 1 Peter. We're going to pick up in chapter 3 and see, see what in, the Lord has in store for us today. Last Sunday, as um, Sister Carolyn was opened up chapter 3 for us, we, we looked through about verse, I'm sorry, it's 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. I was in First Peter, and that's why I said that. <laughs> y'all, I'm, I'm glad y'all paid attention. All right. But anyway, she got through about the uh, the fourth chapter, I mean the fourth verse, and that's about where we're going to pick up at today is Second Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse number 4. But I'm actually going to read verse 3 just to catch us up to speed so we can have a fresh look to see who it is that we're, we're studying. It says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. And, and Sister Carolyn done such a great job last Sunday um, exhorting us in this and explaining what the Spirit of God was, was talking about and teaching through her study. But verse 4, it says, And saying, this is what they say, this is what they promote, this is what, this is their, their ideology. And this is what we have to be careful of because, you know, we as human beings, we all have ideas, we all have an opinion, we all have a a, um, a sense of direction at times that we like that may be a little bit more comfortable for us to accept. Uh, it, it, it goes back many times to what we have in our past, what we've been taught in our past. And where sometimes we're, we're, if we're not careful, we will be driven in that direction. And it's through our own lust that drives us in the wrong direction. Always remember that it's never, the Spirit of God will never lead us in the wrong direction. He will never cause us to go down the wrong road. But it's when we go in a, in a way that we think is right. The book of Proverbs, it tells us there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the ends of that way is death. So we have to be careful that, there, that, we, that we don't go after just an ideology and an opinion, opinionated uh, thought. But it's only what the Word of God teaches. So they, so they say, it says that they say, and the saying, it says, where is the promise of His coming? <clears throat> so they're they're not denying him so much for, you know, everything that's been done up to that point. I want you to get that. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They're saying, where is the Lord? Where are his promises? Where is his coming? Scoffers is another word you can look at it equals a mockery or mockers, mocking the very promise of God when one begins to scoff at what the word of God says and, and, its, and its teaching. So it's important, and as we say it many times from his pulpit, that we Pay attention to the things that we speak, the things that, that do come out of our mouth. It says that they, they focused on what has not yet, they think because in their timeline, their timetable, that since the fathers have fell asleep, he says, where, where is the promise of his coming? All things remain the same. In essence, they're saying he's not coming. They refuse to believe that he's not coming. 
or at least in their lifetime. They say, you know, we've got plenty of time. You know, things are going so good. Things are, are looking up. Things are only going to get better, they say. So they, they come across with this idea that God up to a point was true, but now there is this huge gap in time, this huge delay because of, an, of a thought process that they have embraced. Thinking that because nothing has changed so much from that time up until now, that just because the Lord said he was coming back doesn't mean that he's coming. That's what they say. Through their thoughts and through their actions. For this, it says, verse 5, for this they willingly are ignorant of. Now I want to talk about this just a minute because willful ignorance is a huge problem in the church. Yes. And I'm going to tell you what, this, this didn't come easy for me to stand up here and tell you this because this is something that through this week there's thoughts that have invaded my mind and my thought process that steer, wanted to steer me away from this. But I know what the Spirit of God says. But willful ignorance, church, is a dangerous game to play. A willful ignorance. You know, God honors our will. Whether it's right or whether it's wrong. He, he's, he doesn't, you know, drive us to always do what's right, does he? He, he honors our will. And the dangerous part of this game that many, and that's, I'm not talking about unbelievers, I'm talking about the game that believers will play of willful ignorance. It's dangerous. Not only could it mean the ultimate loss of one's own soul, but for surely it means spiritual disaster. Spiritual misery, spiritual unhappiness. God wants us to be a people of joy, a people of, of peace, a people that has no fear of what a day may bring. And the only way we can have that, we've got to have the, the, the relationship has got to be restored. It has got to be in check it has got to be strong coming from the believer's heart to say, Lord, I want to know more about you. I want to learn more about you. And we cannot choose to say, well, I've got this opportunity, but I just, I'm not going to avail myself of it. God help us. Because we, we at, all of us at one point in time have been there. We we get other things in life many times that may seem to be more important. We get other things that may seem to be more in line with what we need to do first. And I'm not trying to, to present you a regimen or an order or a law that you have to live under, but it's about the condition of one's own heart that has to constantly be in check, allow the Holy Spirit to check us, to draw us, to keep us wanting to come closer. And we're not to compare one with another to say, you know, well, I want to be like Johnny, I'm going to be like James or, or like Ellen. But we were to be like Jesus. And, and in his time, he will draw us and bring us to the place that he has for us. It's a, it's a personal one-on-one, -on -one, heart to heart relationship that he wants to develop. And he has to have a people that are willing to have a willing heart. Because there's 
as I said before, there's a lot of that in the church today of being willful, willfully. Now, ignorance is, is in itself is not a bad thing because that's why the gospel goes forth. That's why preachers are sent forth. That's why ministers and teachers and prophets, evangelists and pastors and apostles are sent forth to spread the knowledge of the Lord to bring people out of that ignorance. And that's so, so ignorance within itself is not bad, but whenever it is presented and the, and the people choose not to receive, they choose for whatever reason, and we're, we, we're going to look at some reasons here in just a minute, but they would choose not to receive because of, of willful ignorance As I said, that is a, that's a serious, serious matter that the Lord doesn't take this lightly and neither should we. And sad to say we all have at times may have done that. The, and I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself, but I want to insert this. How we look at the finished work of the cross the atonement that God provided, how we view that, how we embrace that, everything else hinges upon that fact of us receiving that and believing that and growing in that, and then God will bring unto us the knowledge that we need. That's, that's guaranteed. That's that's an absolute fact that by the grace of God, he will cause us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If but we have got to apply it, we have got to present ourselves. We have got to be in that place to receive that, a place that embraces that, a place that promotes that. And not that and this and that and the other, but that alone. Because we are all susceptible to being mixed up and causing things that are intended for good to come out not so good if we just mix everything up. It will have no effect. So we have to remain true in that. We have to remain faithful in that to know that it's because of what God has already worked in us. He's already called us unto him. We're his child, and we continue to go and follow him as dear children. That we have to grow in, in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. It's by the, his spirit that works within us, the changing of it. You know, you, it's kind of like people sometimes get aggravated with growing pains as as you know, children are growing and they enter into a stage of puberty and they seem like their, their growth really just hits growth spurts and stuff. Many times they go through what's called growing pains. It's the same way sometimes with Christians. If we're not careful, we will get discouraged simply because there's growing pains going on. Well, I'm gonna tell you what, this is the news flash. Whenever we, whenever we surrender and we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And we say, Lord, I'm going to put my will into your will. I don't want my will to be done. I want your will to be done. There's going to be pain takes place. Because we don't, none of us want to give up that easily. It's, it's, it's not something that just comes across and, oh, I don't ever have no trouble with that. No, it's there before you. 24 hours a day, every day of the week, we have that opportunity to take back a little bit of it, to hold back and, and reserve this just for a little while longer. Because we're human. We have within us that, that want, that desire. So Lord, we, we pray that Lord, you change our desires. 
the desires that we used to have, Lord, that you make them new. That we desire things now that would be pleasing unto you. To be things that bring you joy, to bring you, you put a smile upon your face. I, I'm saying all that this morning because the willful ignorance is, is it can creep up on us and we're not and we're not if we're not careful and we won't even be aware of it. And I'm not just talking about coming to church or not coming to church. Coming to Sunday school class or not coming. To, I'm not just talking about that. But it, but it starts within one's own heart. Within one's own spirit. To because this is just this as at y'all, we've all heard it said many times that we don't, we shouldn't live like, you know, that we just live off Sundays and Wednesdays and, and think that we're going to make it. And, and I'm talking about make it strong. Okay? We eat every day, don't we? Physically. So it's every day that we need to eat from his table to present ourselves every day before we're in his presence and eat what he's provided. And to, to want more, to want him more, to, to, to yearn for him more. You know, in the book of Revelation where it ends, it closes, it says, even so, come Lord Jesus. <clears throat> I find that a lot easier to pray that prayer now. I'm just being honest. Because at one time, I, I still had a little bit too many, too much selfishness in control. And maybe I wanted to do something else. Or maybe I, I, I wasn't quite ready. So as we grow and as we progress more, we, we get more at rest in these things. We say, yes, even so come come and thank God for his long suffering because if it were not for his long suffering I'm, I'm afraid these these last days that we're in would have ended a long time ago because he he desires and he wants more and more and more people to respond to live for him to draw to him to say yes so thank God for his long suffering and that he is a God of promise. He said he's coming. And I'm telling you right now, you can, it's better than putting it in the bank. He's coming. He's coming. And we live every day in expectation that he's coming. We walk in that and that in our hearts know that he's coming. For this they are willing ignorant of, it says, now this, this kind of goes into a little bit different. And I'm going to try just to kind of brush this because I don't want to spend all my time here. It says that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. This... We don't have a lot of scripture on this, okay? It's very limited in this, this um, what many theologians call and refer to as a the time before Genesis 1 and 2 and 3. So we're talking about Genesis 1 and 1, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We don't have a lot of a knowledge. We don't have a lot given to us in the word concerning this time. But many theologians agree and believe that the earth was created in original, pure, pristine condition. Given Lucifer is being given charge over the earth and all, all the works that God made. And in Lucifer's rebellion, by wanting to become like God, wanting to be God, 
to even ascend up into the heavens and dethrone God the Father. That God, of course, judged him and brought judgment upon the creation. And all of God's creation was annihilated. It was, it was made into an uninhabitable state for an underperiod amount of time. We don't, it's kind of like a, it's a gap in time that's given. So I can't really go in a lot of detail and I don't want to spend time there, but this is what this is, is talking about, this time. But the point that I want to make in this, and I, I'm, I do want to give you, a, if you want to read a little bit about it and, and kind of study it a little bit more, you can look in, of course, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, Isaiah 14, and Ezekiel 28. Those are some, some areas you may want to go read and study about that. But the point I want to make is the judgment that God brought. God judged, he brought judgment then. So they willingly are ignorant that God judged his creation. They have chosen that not to believe in that, that God's not going to judge again. They've, they've chosen this. They, they, they present this. But it says that the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word, so the same command, the same voice uh, that spoke the world back into a, hab a habitable form, it, at his will, at his command, it will, can be turned into an uninhabitable form again. We're talking about God, the creator, who spoke the heavens and the earth into existence. They, I think about it sometimes and just look whenever we can see a beautiful starry night. And we don't see all the stars, of course. But astrologers estimate that there is 46 trillion stars. And that's a four with a whole bunch of zeros behind it. I, I, I didn't even count them, but I read this. A whole bunch. That's an estimate of how many stars that they say exist. And what's so fascinating about it that these stars, they say, are even suns and other faraway galaxies to other planets. It's pretty amazing. But we, we have Earth. God put us here on Earth. And I believe God wants us to focus on this. He wants us to know that don't get concerned about when we're going to get our ticket to go to the moon. Don't put your, you know, don't start your savings account and set you a, 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 a little side account there to, where you can get your ticket to Mars. Don't concern yourself with that. Man's always trying to figure out a way to escape the judgment of God. Building the tower, you know, they, it's, it, it's, it's not a new problem. It's been, been around a long time. And I, I'm not saying you do, I'm just kind of throwing that in for a funny, but, you know, that's a lot of people, they think about stuff like that. You know, I, I, don't, I don't have a lot to say about it because I don't know a lot about it. But there's, when we're talking about God's judgment, in this, I want us to be reminded of something. The church today is, is, is pictured in Revelations 3, 17 through 20 in there, where it says that, that the church says that they are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. But the Lord says, but you are blind that you are poor and you are naked. It says that, you know, in other words, the church is, is in a place where they think that things are just going to keep getting so better, so good, better and better and better and better, and they're just going to ultimately say, okay, Jesus, you can come back now. 
Come back, set your kingdom up. 1 Timothy 4 and 1, it tells us that how that the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And it goes on as you keep reading through there, it explains what some of those doctrines are. Forbidding to marry, to abstain from certain meats, that's all part of those evil doctrines. Second Timothy 3 and 1, it speaks of the perilous times that are coming, that we are in. And when we, when we see this, the perilous, we, we always just think that it pertains to the things out there. The things, you know, that we encounter at, at the workplace. The things that we encounter when we go into the market. The things that we encounter we see taking place on our streets. Yes, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, and we're seeing that. But he says perilous times will come, and I, that's not just talking about things that we see happening on the street. When something that is in peril, it is, it is a, a dangerous gauntlet, if you will, of a something that one is traveling through. It, is a, it is, seems like there is danger on every side. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he says, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. The perilous times includes even the false doctrines that are being presented and that the church is believing. That's how important it is to understand, to understand the perilous times that we're in. Because what greater peril is there than to lose one's own soul? That is the greatest peril one would ever face. We're not just talking about, you know, getting to Walmart back safely. Which, you know, thank God for his protection. Thank God for his care, for his, his ministering angels that go forth to minister to the heirs of salvation. We have promises in the word of God for that. We can believe that and know that it's true. It's for me. And you can say it's for you. We choose to fear, to walk before the Lord. But these perilous times involve much of what the church embraces. The teachings that the church embraces, the things that the church tries to welcome. And, if, and it's been said before, if, if the church would quit um, giving to false doctrine, if it would stop supporting false teachers but we know that many being deceived will not they will not choose to to take that and of course someone that's saying things like I'm saying today would be labeled an extremist because I do believe there's only one there's only one message there's only one savior there's one way, he says. There's one way. There's not many. There's not two, three, four, five, six, a hundred. But there's one. And we need to be aware of that. And I, and, I, and I know that we are, but we need to continue to be aware, to continue to tell others to be aware, to, as, as we talk to people and we learn a little bit, you know, about their, you know, do they know the Lord? How, where do they go to church? And things that they know and that they, and that they learn. God can use us to speak that. It may be that word that they need to hear and it be a, a pivoting point for them. A, you know, hey, I need to, need to pay attention to what I'm hearing. Boy, it just sounds like I'm bringing division, don't it? <clears throat> I'm just simply trying to, I'm simply just trying to be a spokesman. And I, I believe for the right message. It's important how that we interpret the Bible. And I told you a while ago as I got a little bit ahead of myself, the only way to correctly interpret the Bible is to how we correctly interpret the atonement and know that 
why Jesus came, of why he had to come, and what he came to do. And that it was only one that could do it. We have got to, to, to make that priority one. To always put that out front of everything else that we come in contact with. That is, that is what you know, decides for us. That is what we follow. That is what we cling to. You know, and that, you know, the old songwriters had it right when they sang it through all those songs, the, the words, you know, about the, the cross and how that simply to thy cross I'll cling. Just, just simply to the cross. Just cling simply to it. And, and know that that is our safety. That is our protection. As I said before, it's not... The Bible is not to be interpreted by opinions because we've all got one. Oh, I think this or I think that. No, let's just be open to see what it says and let's be teachable to say, I'm, I'm willing to lay aside everything I ever thought and knew and, and, and put it up against the measuring line, that, that line, that plumb bob, and, and put it up against it and see where it comes out. Just lay everything to the side that I've ever been taught and see if it lines up with what the Lord says. That's where the church has got to get to. That's where we've got to stay. If we're there, let's stay there. And I believe you're there, but let's just stay there. But there's many that will not even attempt, they will not even begin to think. So there's three things I want to talk to you about. There's three excuses, and we're kind of going back to the willing willingly ignorant first of all they put their denomination in front well my denomination is this and that's what I believe most of us have probably been there before the second one is, tra is tradition well, no, my tradition is this. And, and we put that ahead many a times of what the plumb bob of the Word of God has already set the standard. It's tradition. And the third reason of willful ignorance, I think, many times is the one bringing the message. The person that God sent to promote the message to broadcast the message and we says, well I just don't like that person well I'm not going to go there because I'm not going to sit going to sit on that you know because such and such this person that person if we reject the messenger that God sends we have in effect rejected God I know that's strong words and that's it's right. not easy to swallow. If we reject the messenger, I'm talking about though the ones that are bearing truth, bearing thus saith the Lord, that have that are in line with the plumb bob that has already been set, and they're in line with that, and they've been sent by God, and they bring the message, and we reject the messenger, we are in an essence rejecting God. Because God takes that very serious. Even though we can look back with the prophets of old in Israel, how that Israel would reject. They would continue to reject. They would reject the prophets. And at the same time, they was rejecting the one that sent the prophets. So that's three things that, that ignorance, a willful ignorance is, is strengthened by, it's fueled by, it's, 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 uh, it breeds in that. And it grows and it, it festers and it, it's not going to produce anything that's good. It says, and I'm going to read on down now. I, I left off in verse 7. I'm just going to start over. It says, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So here we have in the word of God how that God is going to bring judgment 
upon this world, the world which is now, the heavens and the earth which are now. He, by the same word, first of all, we know that God is going to, by his word, uphold this earth. He's going to keep it. It's going to be kept unto a day of judgment. It's going to be reserved as unto fire, that the earth is going to be judged and the heavens is going to be judged in the coming days. It's coming. It will be judged and along with ungodly this of all form. Verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. One thing he says that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Now we can read through that and kind of brush it off and says, okay, I get it. No, we really don't get it at times because time it seems we think time. We think everything is, is, is on our time. Let's just be honest. You know, and that's why the scripture says that you have need of patience. Time, the way we look at time and the way God looks at time is completely different. God can cause something to, you know, as a day... He can have something happen in a moment or that something that would just bring in slowly over time but he's still God doing the work. It's still God the one, he's the one that is in control. He's still the one that's, you know, infinite as it comes to time. Our time, I want to, I want to end on that this morning just just look at what time kind of means to us. How that we, we know that time, time is probably our most valuable asset. When we stop and think about it, our time. How much is our time worth? You know, we, we many times we, we don't realize our time and we just dribble it away. We just flitter it away and it's gone. You know, it's, it's, it's something we can't stop. We cannot stop time from elapsing. You know, and we, we look at things in our lives sometimes and we say, man, if I could just turn back the clock. If I could just look back and go back a year or or things I should have wished I should have done then. That we're instructed by the Word of God, don't, don't look back. Let's just keep looking forward. Let's keep pressing on. Because there ain't nothing we can do about yesterday. And we've got today. Today is really all that we've got. We've got the hope of tomorrow. We've got the promise of tomorrow. Of, of God fulfilling his work in our life. But what we have is today. And as we know, that's why it's called the present. It's, it's a gift that God gives us. And the Bible has a lot to say. And I think I've got enough time. Yeah, I'm going to go there real quick. If you'll go there with me over in the book of, of Psalms, it says, and this is something I hope that will speak to someone here today and maybe cause us to be a little bit more aware. Uh, I think sometimes time going by just makes us more aware sometimes of, of things. But this has to do, of course, where I, where I ended up on, uh, on verse number eight of, you know, the thousand years. Look at uh, Psalms chapter 90, and I'm going to read through this real quick for time's sake. First of all, in verse 4, it says, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. I'm going to skip down for time's sake, down to verse 10. 
The days of our years are threescore and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is our strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. That's pretty, pretty good advice, isn't it? Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that, me, that we may rejoice and be glad. How many days? All the days of, our, of our, all our days. All our days. That we may rejoice and be glad because of thy mercy. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. So even in the good days and the bad days, we have a reason to rejoice and be glad. Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yeah, the work of our hands establish thou it. And one more place in the 39th chapter and I'll be done of Psalm. It says, This is, again, the importance of realizing our time, redeeming the time, the scripture says, for the days are evil. It says in verse 39, I'm sorry, I'm in 36. Chapter 39, verse number four. O Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth, and mine age is nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. But when we have the Lord, and we have his promise, and we're resting in him, we know that our days can be filled because of his mercy with the joy that he brings. Do you have something to share? Okay, thank y'all for coming today and thank y'all for being a part of everything. God bless you. Praise God.